Good day. As I am making this video um, today, Wednesday, 23rd November 2022, there are reports pouring in of another major Russian missile attack on Ukraine. Again, as of this moment, it's very difficult for me to work out the scale, though it does seem from the early reports that we're talking about a large attack with big uh, jet-powered missiles, the Calibre and the KH-101. Um, but as I usually do, I'm going to wait a couple of hours until the strike is over to try to get an overall sense of where we are and of what exactly is taking place um, as this missile strike um, works its way through. At the same time as we have this enormous missile strike, and it does seem to be a big one taking place, we also have now had definite confirmation that there has been a um, significant progress by the Russian military in clearing Marinka. This is this large fortified town or village um, close to Donetsk, which is an integral and important part of the Ukrainian defences um, in and around Donetsk city. I say defences, though in reality these are almost, if you like, siege works. They were created by Ukraine in the eight years after the fighting in 2014 and 2015. They're very heavily layered. There are trenches and fortified positions. I've actually now seen pictures of some of these fortified positions and they are extraordinarily complex, almost, dare I say it, of Maginot-type quality. Um, and their purpose, as it has always seemed to me, was basically to strangle Donetsk. Every so often, the Ukrainian military would shell Donetsk city. This went on sporadically. There were ever great, you know, varying levels of intensity. Throughout the eight years that these huge fortifications were being built, and it seems to me that you could really describe them as an attempt, in effect, to place Donetsk under a sort of state of permanent siege. So anyway, the Russians, since August, have been making it a priority to break through these defence lines. In August, they captured Pesky, one of the villages, which was a linchpin in this intricately complex defense system. Marinka, it seems, is rather bigger, at least so I understand, and is now largely cleared. There was a report yesterday that the Russians controlled two-thirds of it, but I gather that that proportion has increased, and steadily, remorselessly, the Russians are breaking, what if you like, the siege of Donetsk, and will eventually um, place the besiegers, the Ukrainian military, under effective siege themselves when they reach that point when they are going to threaten the encirclement of the main Ukrainian base in this area, which is Avdevka. So that, we can say, is now confirmed. There's video evidence from Marinka, and it confirms significant Russian advances in this area. Now, though there's some distance between the two places, Ugladar, Vugladar and Marinka are connected by road, and the fighting in Vugladar and the fighting in Marinka really needs to be understood as part of the same overall battle. And it seems that there's also Russian progress in and around Vugladar, though, again, as I discussed yesterday, this is more difficult to assess than what is happening in Marinka. The video evidence for the moment is not fully there, and the Russian Defence Ministry have not been providing a great many reports. But it's likely, or it seems, that at the moment this is a major priority for the Russians. And of course, if Vugladar is captured, if the siege of Donetsk is broken, 
then southern Donbass, the area of the southern Donbass, will to a great extent have fallen under Russian control, and the Russians will be measurably closer to that point when they have cleared the whole of Donbass and the whole of Donetsk region of Ukrainian forces. Um, further north, I would add, there's also been more reports from Bakhmut. As I said, this is a particularly difficult battle to really work out, largely, I suspect, because the Wagner organization is running this battle by itself to a great extent. And I'm not entirely clear about the chain of command between the Wagner group and the overall Russian military forces in Ukraine. I'm going to make a guess that one of General Surovikin's priorities will be to bring the Wagner group under control. Anyway, they've been fighting this private war in um, Bakhmut, though it also seems that they're getting an awful lot of support from the regular Russian military. And I get the impression that there too, things have now shifted further seems that there is actually fighting going on, street fighting going on, both within Bakhmut city itself and in the northern suburb of Solidar. The Ukrainians have been making a massive fight of this and they've been often launching counterattacks against the advancing Russian forces and the Russian forces have never so far been able to completely break the communications lines, the transport lines, into Bakhmut from, if you like, um, central Ukraine. But again, one is starting to get more reports that Ukrainian losses in this area have been so high that the Ukrainians are no longer able to launch the many counterattacks. They used to launch that they've been put into a fully defensive position and with street fighting apparently now having reached the center of Bakhmut and of Solidar, well, we might just might be coming to the end of that particular battle. Let me repeat again my own view. If Vuglodar, Avdivka near Donetsk and Bakhmut, the res Ukrainian resistance in these three places is broken, then we are at that point within the end view of the Battle of Donbass. Um, Kramatorsk and Slavyansk and some other places will remain under Ukrainian control, but the Ukrainian position in Donbass will become increasingly precarious. And I'm going to say straight away that I think that it's going to be much more difficult for the Ukrainians to defend Kramatorsk and Slavyansk than it has been to defend these much more solidly built defense lines that Ukraine has created, both around Donetsk and the so-called Zelensky line that was created from Bakhmut all the way through Solidar up to Siversk in the north. So perhaps we're now approaching that point when the end point of the Battle of Donbass is in sight. And that now brings me to a further discussion. Now, I've often said that I'm not a military person and I really want to emphasize this. I'm even shaky on basic questions like rank. For example, I, um, refer, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but I've never really been able to work out military ranks particularly well. But um, I was reading a long two-part article by one of the American military commentators that I pay a great deal of heed to, who is Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. I hope this time I've got his military rank correct, by the way. Anyway, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, who is a highly decorated US combat veteran and one who certainly understands war in a way that I don't pretend to do. He has outlined what he thinks might be the Russian operational plan over the next few weeks. The big 
winter offensive that the Russians have been talking about. And he has outlined an extremely complex plan of operations. This will obviously be brought into um, play once the Russians have fully integrated all the two, three hundred thousand reservists that they've called up into their armed forces. Anyway, briefly, Lieutenant Colonel Davis anticipates a multi-pronged offensive by the Russians and the key offensive, the key part of this great offensive, as he expects, will be an advance by 75,000 Russian troops or thereabouts. This is, of course, his guess or calculation. And Lieutenant Colonel Davis is extremely careful to make it clear that, as in my case, the Russian general staff does not share its plans with him. But anyway, he anticipates an offensive of around 75,000 Russian troops pushing south from Belarus. Belarus would be the main staging point, but pushing south from Belarus to western, deep into western Ukraine, not to capture cities like Lvov and all of the rest, but to break Ukrainian communications, to disrupt their major supply base, which is in western Ukraine, and by the way, their major recruitment base. He feels that this is the heart of the Ukrainian uh, resistance. It's the major focus point that Ukraine cannot rely, cannot continue the war without. If Western Ukraine is broken, then um, he anticipates, um, Lieutenant Colonel Davis anticipates that Ukraine will not be able to continue the war. And he also thinks that in support of this offensive, there will be a secondary offensive, perhaps also by 75,000 Russian troops. And he anticipates that this will revisit some of those northern cities that the Russians surrounded, encircled for a brief time back in March, whilst the negotiations with the Zelensky government were taking place. Places like Sumy and Chernigov, and perhaps even Kharkov itself. And the purpose of this secondary thrust, the secondary offensive, will be to tie down Ukrainian forces whilst the main attack trundles towards the west. And he also expects a third Russian offensive basically to clear up Donbass. This is going to, this would be a big arrow large and circumvent offensive of the sort that the German Wehrmacht and the Soviet Red Army used to carry out on the Eastern Front during the Second World War and which to some extent or lesser extent happened also by the way um, during the fighting in the West in 1944 and 1945. So it's quite a carefully thought through and set out plan. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Davis admits that it's complex, it's risky, it depends on extreme logistics, very well um, prepared logistics, and of course it also anticipates very high levels of training on the part of the Russian forces. Is it a plausible scenario. Well, I am not in a position to say one way or the other. As I said, I don't know what the Russian general staff is planning. But I'm going to make an observation. Um, 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 and I'm going to make a number of observations about it. And I discuss Lieutenant Colonel Davis's account. Because I think even though I don't personally think that the Russians are going to do any of these things, I think that by, if you like, and I do this with all humility, he's a military man and I am not, 
by arguing against this elaborate battle plan, I think we can get a better idea of what the Russians are up to. Now, there's a number of things I want to say about this plan. Firstly, it directly contradicts what General Surovikin said in that interview he gave um, a few weeks ago on the Russia One television, in which he described his um, approach to the war, and which he also said was a, was an account of the war, uh, uh, an approach to the war that corresponds with the general instructions he'd received from President Putin himself. And Surovikin specifically said that he would not undertake these kind of grand, offensive and envelopment operations that Lieutenant Colonel Davis is talking about. Even if they could be carried out successfully, and it's a complicated plan, more complicated, by the way, than anything, as far as I know, that the United States has attempted, at least since the Korean War. I mean, if you look at the two Iraq wars, for example, that the United States fought, I never saw the United States carry out a plan as complex as this one. But anyway, even if such a complex plan uh, could succeed, which for all I know, it might do. Um, General Surovikin has said that his priority is to preserve Russian lives, to minimize Russian losses as much as possible, whilst causing Ukraine the greatest possible losses. He spoke, in other words, in fact, he spoke quite explicitly of grinding Ukraine down. And he said that it was not his purpose, therefore, to launch large, complicated, big, you know, big arrow offensives like this. And so Lieutenant Colonel Davis's view contradicts what the Russian military commander-in-chief, General Surovikin, has told us about Surovikin's plans for the war. Now, it could very well be, of course, that General Surovikin is not telling us what the Russians are really planning. Deception is a part of war, and it may be that when General Surovikin tells us that he has no big arrow plans, in reality, he does. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's entirely possible. But... I still think we need to take into account what General Surovikin has actually said. Far too many discussions of what the Russians do in every field, in government, in politics, in diplomacy, in economic policy, and of course in military policy as well. Far too many discussions of what the Russians are doing, or planning to do, simply ignore what the Russians themselves say. And I did notice that Lieutenant Colonel Davis seemed to be unaware of General Surovikin's comments, or at least he didn't allude to them in these two articles. The other problem which I have with this large strategy that... Um, Lieutenant Colonel Davis is describing, is that I just don't think the Russians have enough men to carry out an operation of this kind. Even Lieutenant Colonel Davis seemed to admit that, you know, if the Russians were to launch an offensive, even with all of the new fresh troops that they had mobilised, it would still be a tough call with the numbers of troops available. We are looking at perhaps a Russian force of 400,000 men in total, perhaps more, perhaps 500,000 men against a Ukrainian force, heavily weakened, severely depleted of perhaps 360 to 400,000 men. 
but a Ukrainian force which is kept informed about Russian troop movements by NATO intelligence, um, which is to a certain extent still receiving supplies from the West, and which of course has the advantage of interior lines, as military people say. It's centrally positioned. It could allocate forces to deal with every one of these attacks. I think this is just, there just aren't enough troops to carry this out. There are constant rumours in Russia that sometime in the spring the Russians are going to call up another large number of reservists, perhaps 300,000 more. Well, at that point, if we start having forces of 600 to a million, perhaps, well, these kind of very elaborate operations that we're looking at from Lieutenant Colonel Davis, well, then perhaps they become viable. When the Wehrmacht and the Red Army carried out these complex operations during the Second World War, they were functioning with armies of hundreds, of, not just of hundreds of thousands, but millions of men. And as I said, I just don't see that number of troops in total there. Moreover, there aren't anywhere near 75,000 Russian troops in Belarus at the present time. I'm not entirely sure how many Russian troops are in fact in Belarus, but the last figure I heard for the size of the Russian grouping in Belarus is 9,000 men. Now, it could be that at some point this grouping is going to be massively reinforced. If it is, then that will be a clear sign that something very ambitious is being planned. And then at that point, I think we can all start to revise our views and go back to Lieutenant Colonel Davis's approach. But at the moment, that doesn't seem to me to be how the Russians are deploying their forces. It is not consistent with this plan that he is talking about. Now, I've discussed all of this because this brings me back to a key point about this war. When this war began, way back in February of this year, I think that the Russians were looking for a quick resolution. They moved lots of forces into Ukraine. Well, I say lots of forces. Apparently, the Russian force, the total Russian forces at that time, both Russian military plus the Donbass militia came to around 200,000 men. But they did move forces in many directions. They, as I said, encircled all those northern cities. They um, advanced towards Kherson region. They did, they carried out some fairly big moves back in February and March. But the purpose was, I think, not so much to defeat Ukraine militarily. It was, I think, you know, two purposes which were by no means inconsistent with each other and which the Russians, by the way, have confirmed. Something which, again, I come back to, people always ignoring what the Russians say. But the Russians had two purposes back in February and March. One, which was set out by the chief of operations of their general staff, General Rudskoy, and one which was never achieved, by the way, was to isolate the Ukrainian grouping in Donbass. And the Russians appeared to have thought that they'd achieved that when they captured Izium, except it turned out that they were wrong. But anyway, that was one purpose, which was to pin Ukrainian forces down in various parts of Ukraine, whilst the Ukrainian army in Donbass was isolated and effectively encircled. And that was never, as I said, fully achieved. And the second was also not achieved, but it came much closer to success than is widely known or acknowledged, but which has been admitted 
in American publications, including in a long article in Foreign Policy magazine by the US, by the Anglo-British, uh, the Anglo-American rather, historian and official Fiona Hill. And that was to push Ukraine into negotiations and to try to get from the Zelensky government a peace deal. And of course, Russia came very close to achieving that objective in the talks that took place in Istanbul in late March. Ukraine appeared to accept neutral status for itself and gave clear signals that it was prepared also to recognize the loss of Crimea and Donbass, which were, of course, for the Russians, major priorities. Well, that was in February, March. At that time, as I said, the Russians were almost certainly seeking a quick resolution. I think we then had this long period from April to September, when the Russians weren't quite sure what to do, because they hadn't successfully isolated the Ukrainian grouping in Donbass. And as we know, following intervention from the US and British governments, Ukraine retracted all the concessions that it had made in its talks in Istanbul. Something which, by the way, I still seethe about. It seems to me that this was a disastrous move by the Western powers, the American and British powers, and one which, well, we're seeing its consequences every day now in Ukraine. Before I continue, by the way, with my main point, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister of that period, who's now visited um, Kiev, who is now, um, of course, no longer Prime Minister, but who back in April visited Kiev and was instrumental in getting the Ukrainians to retract all the concessions that they had made. He talked them out of all of those concessions. Anyway, Boris Johnson has now been giving interviews in which he has said, in my opinion, probably correctly, that the French did not believe that there would be a Russian and a Russian-Ukrainian war. And I think that's likely. I think in many of the discussions that took place last year, the French were quite openly sceptical. So I think that um, events got out of control. And I think some of the original French scepticism might have been justified. And then the second thing which Johnson says, which I think is absolutely not the case, is completely untrue and incredibly, um, I think, borderline dishonest, actually, is that he says that Germany actually wanted Ukraine to be defeated quickly. And I find here again more examples of Johnson's extraordinary myth-making. There's nothing about the actions of the German government since the start of the conflict which suggests that the German government wanted a quick defeat for Ukraine, so as presumably to carry on doing business with the Russians as before. All of the indications are that the dominant faction, at least in the German government, remains determined, has been determined throughout to confront the Russians over Ukraine. So anyway, just wanted to say all of that. But anyway, the point is that after that period when the peace talks in Istanbul failed and it became clear that the Donbass forces, Ukraine's Donbass forces, were not going to be isolated. I think the Russians went through a long period of debating with themselves what to do, debating with their allies or friends what to do. And I think they hit on a plan in September. And we saw all the various steps that they took, the call up of reservists, the appointment of General Surovikin, the eventual pullback from Kherson. And all of this points to my thinking to the Russians deciding to engage in a long war. So where they were looking for a short one back in 
the spring. I think now they have decided that they're going to wage a war of attrition against Ukraine and against the West. They're seeing the ever-growing economic and social problems that are happening to the West. They've shored up their various alliances and friendships with various countries. They've stabilised their own economy. And there are now growing predictions that next year their economy will be returning to growth. I discussed a few days ago the extraordinarily optimistic comments about the state of the Russian economy made by Russia's uh, Deputy Prime Minister Igor Belusov. So, I think that the Russians have decided that what they're going to do is that they're going to wage a long war. They think that a long war actually works to their advantage. It keeps their own casualty levels low. It severely weakens Ukraine. It causes severe attrition to Ukraine. Ukraine cannot sustain a long war by itself. Already, it is entirely dependent on Western financial and aid and military supplies to keep fighting. And I think the Russians calculate that as the pressure, the pain dial in Europe grows, that at some point the Western powers themselves will tire of this commitment, this unending commitment to Ukraine. And already we're getting more and more reports of serious concern now that Western supplies, the weapons, have become depleted by the number of weapon systems that have been supplied to Ukraine, with worries apparently about the cost of replacing these weapon systems, and also the inability, even in Western production, um, to keep up with Ukrainian demands. So I think that the Russians have decided a long war in Ukraine, bleeding Ukraine dry, bringing it to the state of collapse, causing major disruption and chaos in Ukrainian society, and grinding down the Ukrainian forces that will serve their interests ultimately in Ukraine itself. And I think they also feel that it will serve their interests ultimately with the West too. It will mean that sooner or later, not only does the West tire of Ukraine, but when the collapse in Ukraine eventually comes, not only will Russian society and Russian military be largely intact, indeed even strengthened, but the West in general, at least the European part of the West, will be severely weakened. That the West, the Western militaries in, will have run down, depleted their resources. Western societies will have gone through deep economic problems. We're seeing this happen now in Britain. Before long, we're going to see this happen in Central Europe too. European societies are going to be divided against each other. And at that point, when the final collapse in Ukraine comes, I suspect that the Russians calculate that then they can dust off those two treaties that they tried to get the West to agree to last year. The treaties about the non-extension of NATO eastward and the pullback of NATO forces to their 1998 lines in Germany. And who knows, perhaps they will demand even more at that point, but we'll just have to wait and see. So I think that the Russians have gone from a short war plan, which was what it was back in February, when I suspect a lot of the actions that the Russians took were hurriedly improvised in under the pressure of events and the pressure of the Ukrainian attack on Donbass that in my opinion, the Russians genuinely believed it was going to take place. And
I think today, on the contrary, after the rethink that took place over the summer, the Russians have decided that their interests are better served by a long war, by a war of attrition. And bear in mind, this is exactly what General Surovikin is saying. He's not talking about knocking out Ukraine. He's talking about grinding Ukraine down. And I think that, as I said, if you look at Russian actions, the way in which they've set up this coordinating council, for example, to coordinate the military mobilization of parts of their economy, the calling up of reservists, the straightening of their front lines, the build up, building up of fortified lines along the front lines that they control, the creation of reserves, all of that is consistent with a long war. And the Russians are now taking more steps which seem to be pushing events further in that direction. I spoke about how a few days ago the Russians launched the first small attacks on the Ukrainian gas transport system. Yesterday, the Russians did something further. They accused Ukraine of siphoning gas, which had been allocated to Moldova, and they threatened to cut off supplies of gas passing through Ukrainian pipelines. The one, in fact, Ukrainian pipeline that is still functioning and which continues to supply Russian natural gas to the West. So the Russians have said that the continued piping of gas through that pipeline might be coming to an end very soon. Cutting off Ukraine's supply of gas, because to be very clear, what is called re reverse flow is not really reverse flow at all. What Ukraine does is it takes gas, which passes through its pipelines from Russia, allocated to European customers, keeps it for itself, pays those European customers for that gas and pays those European customers for that gas with money it is given by Europe itself. It's been a bizarre, it's been a weird operation, but that's what's been happening now for some time. I understand that the Ukrainian pipelines are not designed to be able to cope with reverse flow. So that's what's been going on. If the Russian gas stops, Ukraine's own supply of gas stops. It's another foreign currency earner that Ukraine loses, but it's also perhaps another part of its energy system that comes to a stop as well. But of course, it's also going to reduce further still the flow of pipeline gas to Europe. So that, it seems to me, is again consistent with the Russians waging a long war rather than a short one. And if I'm right about that, then it seems to me that we can start to rethink what Russian military strategy is. Instead of the big arrow offensives talked about by Lieutenant Colonel Davis, it seems to me more plausible that the Russians will work first and foremost on resolving the unresolved issue of Donbass, grinding down Ukrainian forces in Donbass, clearing Donbass itself, ending this Ukrainian shelling of Donetsk city, and pushing their forces east to the Dnieper River, bringing Russian forces close to the big industrial city of Dniepro, Dniepropetrovsk, as the Russians still call it, which is west, on the western bank of the Dnieper, and also bringing, by the way, the Russian forces 
to the heart of Ukraine itself, right into the center of Ukraine. And if the Russians are able to do that, well, as I said yesterday, I think that Zaporozhye, the position of Zaporozhye um, in the south, will um, become untenable. The Ukrainian position in Zaporozhye would become untenable. And perhaps the Russians would be in a position also at that point to revisit the unresolved question of what to do about Kharkov. And Kharkov is an unresolved but important question for the Russians, not just because this is a major industrial city of Ukraine, and formerly of the Russian Empire and of the Soviet Union, uh, and in fact, Ukraine's second biggest city. Um, not, only, not only because of that, but also because, as has become very clear over the last couple of weeks, in fact, really throughout the war, <clears throat> control of Kharkov region is important from a Russian point of view because Ukraine has persistently tried to launch attacks onto Russian territory, on, into Belgorod <coughs> and towards Kursk, Russian cities, from Kharkov. So gaining control of Kharkov region, the city of Kharkov, all on the east bank of the Dnieper, all Russian speaking, zones would of course consolidate Russian position in Ukraine but it would also provide a strong buffer zone for Russia's own territories. So I think that's much more likely the priority. It would be a grinding war, it would be a war of gradually grinding down the Ukrainian troops. I think that it would also be a war um, which might involve destroying the Dnieper bridges so as to isolate Ukrainian forces east of the Dnieper. I think, as I said, at some point that will come. And that seems to me much more consistent with what I have seen of Russian military operations up to this point. Now, on the topic of the Dnieper bridges, I uh, received an email again from somebody who is very familiar with the military history of the Eastern Front. Um, I know how familiar this person is. And um, this person made the point to me that in 1943, November 1943, the Red Army was able to cross the Dnieper and capture Kiev. Note that this happened in autumn, so in about roughly this time of year. And though the west bank of the Dnieper is higher than the east bank, the Dnieper is so long that it was simply impossible for the Wehrmacht, despite having much larger forces than the Ukrainian army does, to defend every part or place along the Dnieper. And it was not difficult, therefore. It was not an insuperable barrier at that time for the Red Army. The Dnieper was not the insuperable barrier for the Red Army that many people think. And that, of course, was done without the Red Army having access to any of the bridges. Now, I think that is true. <laughs> I have no doubt that that is true. And I also think it's probably even more true today. Bridging equipment far more sophisticated today than it was back in 1943. The ability to transport troops across a river is much greater today than it was in 1943. You can build pontoon bridges, you can develop ferry boats, you can find all kinds of ways of crossing a river. And I'm sure that the Red Army, the, Red, the Russian Army can do that. And again, I think if we get to that point when the Russians are on the east bank of the Dnieper across its entire length, then frankly, Ukraine will be in such crisis by that point that operations like that will become much more practical. Anyway, that's my own thought. I'm just outlining here 
how I expect this war to go. So I do expect a major Russian offensive this winter in December, January. I expect that def offensive to be concentrated on Donbass and ending U Russia's problems in Donbass. There might be a secondary offensive in Kharkiv region and perhaps eventually towards Zaporozhye, but I do not expect this complex in offensive operation that is being talked about by Lieutenant Colonel Davis. So this is a long discussion about somewhat um, theoretical things, but anyway, I've set out how I think the war will go, and I've also set out along the way some of the events that are taking place over the course of this war. Now, let's just go over some facts, some of the things that we now know. It seems that the Western powers are having enormous trouble agreeing the mechanics of this oil price cap idea that they're trying to impose on Russian oil. There's talk that the actual full entry of this price cap is going to be delayed. India has in effect been told that it's exempted from the oil price cap. Other countries undoubtedly will ignore it. And the former Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin Donald Trump's Treasury Secretary, somebody who pretty much everybody acknowledges was pretty good at his job. He's come out and he said that this oil price cap idea was one of the dumbest ideas that he's ever come across. Not only does he predict it will fail, but he clearly thinks it will fail dismally. And I have no reason to doubt that that is consistent with everything that I've said. Probably for a couple of months, the Russians will have to sell their oil to India and Turkey and China and all those other countries at a perhaps rather bigger discount than they might otherwise have done if this oil price cap idea had not been introduced. But they can easily absorb that loss. And over time, I fully expect things to sort themselves out, to smooth themselves out as the market begins to gain, um, est establish its own sort of ascendancy over this. The second thing I'm going to say is that the weather apparently in Europe is now getting a great deal colder. It's been colder in London for some time, but apparently in Europe it's now going to get much colder, which is going to result in the further faster depletion of the gas reserves. And there has been much talk about this. I think that people, a lot of people, are over complacent about the fact that the Europeans filled their gas reserves, their underground gas reserves to brim. I've said previously that this is a misunderstanding of what the purpose of those underground gas reserves was. It was not to be able to provide Europe with all the gas it needed throughout the winter in the event of a supply interruption. These gas reserves were created by Gazprom in order to smooth out issues of flow. And without more pipeline gas from Russia, coming in, I think it's going to be very difficult to keep all of these reserves running effectively over the next few months. And of course, if the winter is cold, and the predictions are it's going to become a lot colder, those reserves are going to start getting depleted, and we're probably going to see rises in gas prices across Europe very quickly, very soon. So I think that's the second thing I wanted to say. The third is that Russian diplomacy has been very, very busy negotiating with Turkey and Iran over President Erdogan's plan to launch this great offensive in Syria. I don't think that the Russians believe that they can prevent President Erdogan from launching this offensive entirely. I think that they expect that this offensive will take place. But there's just been a joint statement by Russia, Turkey and Iran, basically reaffirming 
earlier agreements and in fact piling on the pressure on the Syrian Kurds and on their American sponsors. Now, this is going to be a complicated, long resolved, this is a long standing problem. We're probably not close yet to any resolution. President Erdogan, as he often does, has said things that are critical of the Russians about the Kurds, but it's absolutely clear that ultimately, if there's going to be an attack by the Turkish army on the Kurds in Syria, then the country that's going to face the biggest challenges is the United States, which is the backer of the Kurds. And already the Kurds have told the United States that they have now stopped operations against ISIS, the jihadi group that the United States um, supported the Kurds in fighting, and which was the original justification for the um, Kurdish-US alliance, because from now on, the Kurds are more concerned about the threat from Turkey. And interestingly enough, even and as Turkey's relations with the Kurds have deteriorated, Iran's relations with Kur the Kurds, including Kurds in Iran itself, are deteriorating as well. There's apparently been some kind of attempted insurrection in some Kurdish areas of Iran, and I'm getting reports, again very difficult to confirm, but indisputably true, of the Ukraine, Iranian security forces moving on some of these Kurdish towns in order to re-establish control over them. I should say that generally the history of Iranian Kurdish relations has tended to be good both within Iran and beyond it. Um, Kurdish, as I understand, is an Iranian language, is, 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 is part of the same family tree as the other Iranian languages. So there is a certain cultural affinity, though apparently most Kurds are Sunni Muslim as opposed to Shia. I don't know what the position is in Iran itself. But anyway, there's been some fighting and the U the Iranian authorities are again in effect pointing the finger at the United States as having instigated these um, these events in some of these Iranian um, I Iranian Kurdish centers. I don't by the way know to what extent the problems in the Kurdish areas are connected with the protest movement we've been hearing so much about in Iran over um, the um, wearing uh, the, the wearing of forms of dress by Iranian M Muslim women and the mistreatment of an Iranian woman. My own impression is that those protests, which were much wide, more widespread but much more scattered and probably um, uh, less critical to the Iranian government, have been brought under control for some time. Whereas this fighting with the Kurds seems to have a somewhat different nature. But anyway, all of this is coming at the same time as there's been more threats about from the United States towards Iran. There was an intelligence assessment by the United States, which appeared to say that the United States expects that Iran will acquire nuclear weapons within about five years, and that it will, within about 10 years, have a more sophisticated ballistic missile article than North Korea does. And given how the United States has up historically considered Iran um, a, a danger, that all seems to me to point to the final collapse of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And there's now serious talk again of a US-Israeli attack on Iran. I will say this, if such a thing happens,
well, we're going to see a major crisis in the Middle East that is unavoidable. Whether what is really driving all of these events with Iran is concern about Iran itself, or whether perhaps it's also an in attempt to create issues between Iran and some of the Arab Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, at a time when the Saudis seem to be edging towards the Eurasian powers, talking about joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the BRICS, well, that we, I'm not in any kind of position to say. But anyway, it looks as if the war drums in the Middle East, both in Syria with Turkey and in Iran, are beating louder. And all of this, of course, part of that great confrontation between the West and the Eurasian powers, which seems to be intensifying at all times with the United States, as far as I can see, pushing as hard as it possibly can to create crises in various places in order to tie down its adversaries and to some extent to distract and confuse them. But all of these crises multiply the risks to the international system and ultimately, of course, to the United States itself. So we are in complex times. The Republicans are now formally in control of the House of Representatives. They are now talking about launching their own investigations, not just of the Biden administration, but of members of President Biden's inner circle. And I'm choosing my words here very carefully indeed. One way or the other, I expect, with all of these events shaping out as they are, I think it is highly likely, as I've said before, that in 2023, Ukraine will be last year's story. So, a long war by the Russians, by the way, even as I've been making this program, I should say that the Russian military have just issued a categorical denial that there have been any discussions between their chief of staff, the chief of uh, the Russian general staff, General Gerasimov, and senior NATO officials about allowing um, ships peaceful access to the Black Sea. The Russians have categorically denied that there's been any contacts between them and NATO about any of these things. Quite an emphatic statement, and I'm getting more and more reports, which all of which suggest that this latest Russian missile attack on Ukraine um, is at least as devastating as those which we've seen before. Anyway, I've been speaking now almost for an hour. I think this is a good point to stop. I hope I've given you some idea of the way in which I expect this war to develop. I think that um, there will be um, that the Russians have decided on a long war, calculating that wars of attrition always end to their advantage and I think I am right and I am also going to say just more news pouring in that apparently the whole of Moldova is apparently this is I have, can't really confirm this but apparently the collapse of Ukraine's energy system is now having an effect in Moldova where there's large protests going on all the time against the pro uh, Western government there and apparently Moldova is now also out of completely out of electric power and I'm also getting more and more news about collapse further collapses of the electricity system across Ukraine but anyway this is where I stop more undoubtedly for me to talk about tomorrow and in the meantime, all that's left is for me to wish you a very good day. Just to remind you again, you can find all our videos on Locals, Rumble,
um, Odyssey, BitChute, Rockfin and Telegram. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You can also go to our shop and buy the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all of those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button and also to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. As I said, big events underway, even as I'm making this program. And more from me soon.